Thanks very much for that nice introduction, David. And uh, we'll uh, privilege to speak at this. I think it's the 10th anniversary of this conference and um, very nice new location, which has also got a, a view of the water, which obviously makes me feel more at home. But this is the title of my talk and I have uh, no relevant declarations. This is what I'm going to talk about, so I'll call it the coastal path. So a little bit about me, first of all, and my rather unusual career path, and then about digital pathology and how it enabled me to um, move to this lovely location. That's a view from my balcony on the right there. And uh, the main part of the talk really is to go through how um, I've been using the last few months, um, trialing the IVEX Galen uh, AI uh, to to look at some classical and unusual gastropathology cases, basically trying to beat it. Wrap up the uh, and then how we're planning to use digital pathology and AI um, in the future. And of course, this is the, the question that everyone always asks is, do, do we think that AI is going to replace us? So this was uh, me uh, 50 years ago, believe it or not. So my, my parents were 10 pound palms, moved out to the west coast of Australia. And they used to leave me sort of walking, crawling around in the garden, um, picking up dangerous bugs and things like that. And I think this sort of fostered my curious nature nerd um, characteristics, which eventually led me into doing pathology. Um, so I went we back, back to the UK and I initially studied uh, biology. And went from that to being a cancer cell biologist effectively and then went into medicine after that and probably because of my maybe my stature and my um, initial interest in surgery I initially went into surgery um, before uh, the, the curiosity in sort of cancer cell biology put me back, brought me back into histopathology and uh, I was also a, 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 an ornithologist um, you know, to put my hand up and say, I'm sure there's a few other histopathologists lurking out there that are interested in this. Um, and I was thinking about what it, what's the similarities between histopathology and bird watching. There's obviously a, a, a experienced bird watcher will be able to tell you that the one on the uh, left is a insectivore, and the other one has got a different kind of beak and probably breaks open seeds. You know, effectively in histopathology, that's what we do. We look at morphological features, and we're able to some way predict behavior based on those features and I thought what I think is fascinating in the AI revolution is being able to train those microscopic features whether we're able to recognize them initially or not um, to predict behavior of tumors so from bird beaks to a famous pecker um, Dr Loren um, the first um, gastric cancer classification back in the 60s he was just using um, H and E stains and looking at uh, specimens you know, no help with from immunohistochemistry was able to recognize that there were two main kinds of gastric cancer. On the left, the intestinal type, um, which forms glandular structures and looks like colon cancer effectively, tubules. And on the right, um, characterized by the signet cell, which I've put up there, uh, the diffuse type um, adenocarcinoma. And he was able to recognize that these have very different behaviors. The morphology is different on the macroscopic level. Um, the intestinal type forms solid and ulcerated masses, usually at the gastroesophageal junction. And the diffuse type um, often infiltrates the, the tissues of the stomach and uh, to form a stiff bag like appearance that, that our clinical colleagues call linitis plastica. Um, the diffuse type also has um, a tendency to spread um, usually through through the peritoneum and, and form metastatic uh, deposits earlier. Um, they also have, um, now we know, have different mutations as well, um, which uh, AI should be able to help us with at some point. So when I started as a, a, a new consultant, uh, I think after about a year, I was thrust into this regional position as upper gastrointestinal pathology lead for one of the biggest um, upper GI centres in the country. Um, that perform about 100 uh, major resections and I was reviewing at least five or 600 um, additional biopsies um, from five different hospitals in this southwest um, area. Um, and that I really think that those 
it's, it's about 10% of those cases that are the really difficult ones. Most of them are straightforward adenocarcinomas, but in that pie chart, um, you get the sort of suspicious ones and the, you know, probably cancers. And then you've got things like Barrett's dysplasia, which is very subjective and requires um, second opinions and um, a lot of um, showing around to colleagues. And, you know, there's about, when I've audited before, up to 6% major discordance, diagnostic discordance on central review. So I felt that it was important to have central review, um, but it is an expensive um, uh, uh, resource, really. That was always a telelinked um, uh, MDT right from the beginning. Um, so it hasn't changed massively through COVID, um, but other things have, and I'll go into those. So those of you that aren't from the UK, the Southwest Peninsula is there in the box, um, surrounded by beautiful coastline. And in the centre um, of Devon, you've got Dartmoor as well, which is a beautiful uh, inland area. So no surprise why you'd want to live there. It is a complicated cancer network, though, with five hospitals um, in, in my particular specialties, Plymouth is the uh, is the, the central specialist centre, um, which is although not huge distances from the other hospitals, um, often on very small roads. And in Devon and Cornwall, we get this kind of traffic commonly, uh, cows and tractors and things like that. So, although um, the local MDTs from the five um, trusts leading into the specialist MDT on a Thursday. Uh, the, the clinical information could be transmitted electronically almost instantly, and the radiology is quite quickly transferred. The histopathology um, often takes at least a week, believe it or not, um, in the conventional form. So it was a no-brainer, really, that we wanted to set up a, a digital uh, histopathology network. So the plan was to have the sector um, packed, um, and then uh, the three biggest hospitals in the region, Cornwall, Plymouth, and uh, Royal Devon and Exeter uh, will have 1,000 slide scanners, and then the two smaller hospitals, 250 slide scanners. Um, this was hosted on the um, uh, Exponential E network. So in 2018, I moved from uh, living and working full time in Plymouth to um, where I live now, which is Porth Town on the north coast of Cornwall. For the obvious reason, it's a beautiful place to live. Um, but uh, in order to carry on my specialist role, which I dearly wanted to do because it's one of the most favourite parts of my work, um, I needed digitisation really to make it viable. Um, I did actually um, have um, half a day of uh, still visiting Plymouth and still being able to do some work there, but trying to coordinate complex cases, second opinions um, in a timely manner. Obviously, digital pathology was essential. Initially, um, I started using um, uh, this scanner from Objective Imaging, which takes two slides, normal size slides or a, or a mega slide, and published last year uh, my, my own sort of validation of the benefits um, of using digital pathology to, um, to work remotely in this way. As a result, I also had a range of interesting gastric pathology uh, cases to test uh, with the AI. So I'm sure most of you will be aware of um, the great work that IBEX has done already, um, particularly in prostate mm -hmm. and breast. Uh, their newest algorithm is the gastric one. Um, and even though it is the newest, um, it's also already been um, tested on more than a million slides um, in every continent except Antarctica, as far as I, I know. It was also um, an app that's uh, available on the sector amplifier market. So um, of benefit to us in uh, in our Cetra network. There's also been a, a, a UK based, mainly UK based um, validation of AI assisted gastric biopsy diagnosis using the IBEX algorithm run by my colleague Manuel at, at UCH. And um, with the IBEX AI combined with um, pathologist review compared with pathologist review alone, um, the Galen gastric was found to lower the major discrepancy rate in all of these major categories. So carcinoma versus high-grade lymphoma, neuroendocrine tumours, dysplasias, lymphomas, and H. pylorogastritis. 
So I've only been using this algorithm for a few months, but I had a, a simple idea, or we had a simple idea together with Ibex, was that I would just test with as many complex and difficult cases as I could, as well as some straightforward cases to um, and upload those to the to the Ibex platform in an anonymized way and then compare the results. And effectively, what I was keen to do was to try and beat it with some unusual and difficult cases. So the first one's a pretty straightforward one that we see pretty much every week, unfortunately and sadly. Um, so it's a middle-aged man who um, had gastric outlet obstruction. It was known pretty much certain to be clinically a cancer, um, but uh, very difficult. Um, as I showed you the linitis plastica picture, the mucosa is often completely normal underneath um, to the to the uh, to the endoscopist, and it often takes at least one or two goes to try and get a, uh, a, a enough cancer in it to make a diagnosis. So this was the second attempt to find the cancer. This is a low power view of the multiple fragments. They did what's called bite on bite biopsies to try and get as much tissue as possible, and that's the um, heat map. Um, of the Galen AI, which um, is red over that one millimeter diameter uh, fragment, uh, which when you zoom in um, is cancer. So if we take off the um, the heat map, you can see that this is um, a signet ring cell cancer with a mucinous stroma. I've just put the, my signet ring up there as well, again, just to show you here that these cancer cells have the signet ring morphology. So this patient um, wasn't, uh, he was too advanced to have surgery, um, like uh, many of these patients uh, went on to have um, testing, predictive marker testing, initially HER2, which in my experience is always negative for these. Um, we have to go through a sequential um, testing protocol, which in my opinion could be speeded up um, significantly with the AI. Um, First of all, with HER2, and then going on to, in this patient, um, and if, uh, eventually had a, a raised um, PDR1, which gave them some therapeutic options. So, the summary of that case it's obviously a pretty straightforward case. Um, most pathologists would see that. Um, however, it is a tiny area of the biopsy that was involved, and um, it's extremely helpful to have an AI just put the, um, the heat map straight on that area of cancer certainly see cases like this missed relatively frequently. So the Ibex AI is very sensitive for detecting tiny foci overlooked by a busy pathologist. This second case is a bit more difficult. I certainly tripped up on this at one point. This is a retrospective case, so um, the clinical was pretty vague. They just said there was a red patch in an elderly lady. Um, at low power, these biopsy fragments look quite blue, which um, usually means they're inflamed, which indeed these were. And this was the AI algorithm for H. pylori gastritis, which was showing up um, in red in some areas. And as has been mentioned already, that organism was very difficult to see on digital slides. I went on and did a H. pylori immunostain, which found lots and lots of organisms. So this is an H. pylori gastritis. However, I did find another area which I thought needed further investigation. The AI algorithm also detected um, an area suspicious of low-grade lymphoma, which was the exact same area of the biopsy which I was suspicious of. Um, so there was a dense monocytoid uh, B cell in infiltrate with these sort of rather pale looking lymphoid cells and um, a gland which looks damaged by the um, lymphoid cells in the center there, which is exactly the area which was highlighted. And the immunohistochemistry revealed these were all B cells that were CD20 positive. So this looked like a, a low grade malt lymphoma, a mucosal associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. However, when I was doing the other immunohistochemistry, including a cytokeratin, which we usually use to look for lymphoepithelial lesions in malt lymphoma, there was just this little area that just looked a bit abnormal on the cytokeratin stain. And when I put on the AI algorithm, it easily picked up. This is a tiny focus of cancer that cut in on the sixth level. So it wasn't on the initial immuno, uh, on the initial H &E. And there's the adenocarcinoma. There was also an additional area which I didn't spot until I put on the AI algorithm. And this was in the crush area where the forceps had bitten the, the, the biopsy off. See this crushed area here. And that was an area of adenic, intestinal type adenocarcinoma as well. So this patient 
had an H. pylori gastritis, but she also had low grade malt lymphoma and asynchronous adenocarcinoma. It's not that unusual because H. pylori is a carcinogen that can cause both of these conditions. Interesting, this patient responded well to H. pylori eradication um, and has, has gone on to have a curative treatment for her gastric cancer. I thought this was interesting because not only is ABEX IBEX AI picking up the H. pylori gastritis, it's also picking up the lymphoma and the small focus of adenocarcinoma. And I thought it was interesting that it's particularly good at finding these crushed areas in the biopsy forceps marks, which I think pathologists sometimes find difficult to assess without immunohistochemistry, for example. And multiple diagnoses. I think it's quite easy as a pathologist to think I found the diagnosis now and then to move on. But, you know, there are sometimes secondary and even tertiary diagnoses. So case three, this was um, a lady who had some ulcers in her stomach and the AI, there was also H. gastritis here and she had some cancer found. Um, you can see there was high prob probability on the, on the, um, the heat map. What was interesting about this case is if you take the heat map off, it looks like a diffuse gastric cancer. However, when I did immunohistochemistry, this was estrogen receptor positive, ecoderin negative, GATA3 positive. This was metastatic lobular carcinoma. In this particular patient, there was no clinical suspicion of this diagnosis. This is another case of lobular carcinoma, which I had referred to me. The original pathologist had picked it up actually which is particularly impressive because this had classical signet ring cells in it. So really, it just looked so much like gastric cancer. So this is the learning points from this particular case. Lobular carcinoma is a close mimic of diffuse gastric cancer. It may not be suspect suspected clinically, and it can mimic primary gastric cancer. It's particularly important that pathologists know about this because um, we don't want these patients having gastrectomies. So they want to be treated for their breast cancer. So it's it's rare, but we do see gas uh, mucose uh, metastases to the stomach. And I've seen many cases, and I wanted to test it with as many cases as possible. So it's able to recognize metastatic breast cancer, but could it recognize other types of cancer? So this is a lady who could easily have had breast metastatic breast cancer. She did have a classic linitis plastica appearance on the CT scan, this enhancing mass here. And this was a really tricky one. For some reason, I think I've been working with the AI for a little while at this point. And I um, had noticed on the original H&E that there were some abnormal vessels deep in the mucosa. I was suspicious because we'd, I'd seen the CT scan and I cut through to level 11 until I found this 0 0.2 millimeter focus that the AI picked up straight away. Deep in the mucosa, in fact, it's in a, in a blood vessel. If I take off the you can see there that there's an area of cancer within that vessel. Could have been breast, it could have been breast, it could have been gastric. I did a wide range of immunohistochemistry. It was TTF1 positive and CK7 positive, negative for all the other relevant markers. And it turned out this patient had known lung cancer, but it had been done up the road. And there wasn't any local um, uh, clinical information to suggest this patient had lung cancer. So the IBEX is very good, again, for recognising these tiny foci of cancer. In fact, that, that area of cancer started to show up on the heat map before I could see it on the H&E, interestingly. Um, so I tested it with lots of other types of metastatic cancer. I had another lung that I found in my archive. I found a renal cell carcinoma, again in vessels, a pancreatic cancer with tests to the stomach, and a malignant melanoma as well. So I started to think at this point, maybe the AI is too sensitive and it's just calling everything cancer. We've, we've heard about, you know, the sensitivity is the important bit because we want to get the cases, the important cases to the pathologist. But, you know, it's less useful if it's calling things cancer that aren't cancer. So I, I had some good cases from, that had been sent away um, at times of short staffing um, and the reporting pathologists in the external uh, reporting had raised suspicion of cancer or actually called something cancer outright, but I found that later they weren't. So I tested those. This was one where uh, there was this infiltrate of slightly hyperchromatic cells in the mucosa of the stomach underneath a relatively normal mucosa. 
uh, the AI cancer algorithm highlighted it, but um, didn't think it was cancer. Moving on to the neuroendocrine um, heat map, it picked it up strongly. And indeed, this is a grade one, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And then stomach, these are quite common and they're usually small polyps that are surveilled, uh, have surveillance rather than um, any radical treatment. This was an interesting case um, for one of my colleagues. Um, looks like a signet ring cell cancer, but was actually a fairly diminutive polyp um, that was taken off. And uh, I, I really thought the AI might call this cancer. <laughs> <laughs> but I put on the uh, AI, the AI for cancer and it didn't think it was cancer. Um, and this is something I've seen a few times now: um, gastric parietal cell vacuolation that's related to long-term proton pump inhibitor therapies. It's quite rare, but you do see it every now and then. And that's Runjan Chetty has written a, something in histopathology related to that. And then uh, I think this is the last case. There was also a, a benign Russell body gastritis, which again can concern pathologists due to these pseudo signal ring cells. So finally, my, so my experience of where the AI added value. These this is relating to the case I've also shown it. What, what I was thinking about actually just sitting listening to the previous talks um, is, you know, how, how can we use AI in the future? My first feeling was, wouldn't it be great to pick up these abnormal cases and give them to pathologists? And I think that obviously is a, is a very important and useful uh, use of the AI. But I think actually screening out the normals could be very useful too. I mean, maybe we could give these to our trainees or biomedical scientists to sign out because the, the, the algorithm is incredibly sensitive. Although, you know, my experience is it does bring up areas of concern, which is actually what we want. And David and I have talked about this as well. Um, so it brings your attention to these um, to these features and then you can decide whether or not they're malignant or of concern. Um, I, it's made me seeing the, the prostate algorithm. It's made me interested in reporting prostate biopsies again. I think well, I could probably have a go at those, even though I haven't reported them for years. Um, so it could allow the generalist to work as a specialist and feel safe and feel like we're remembering to report all the right things. Esophageal dysplasia is a really use, a really important uh, use of, of this AI, I think, um, which I'm not sure is generally on offer at the moment, but I know that IBEX are working on. Um, and as we've talked about, subtyping tumours. At the moment, this is just saying this is a cancer, but, you know, I'm interested in you know, we, we know that signet ring cancers, for example, have, have a very different behaviour. Could we quantify the number of signet ring cells in a biopsy and, and see if we can predict their behaviour? Can we predict their response to certain drugs? Um, quantification, we can't be bothered with, I don't think, as pathologists, you know, when we're triaging cases for molecular testing. Uh, so predicting phenotype from morphology is, is a fascinating um, role, I think. And one of my favourite books in pathology is one by Rezai called uh, the pathologist guiding the surgeon's hand. So perhaps AI could be guiding the pathologist's eye and more. And as people have said many times before, the pathologist with the AI gives the best possible outcomes for patients. So those are my acknowledgements. Many of these people are in the room at the moment. Any questions? Tim, thanks very much. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, Phenomenal performance of AI there in, in gastric gastric pathology. So, um, did you uh, did you succeed in defeating the AI at all? Then or you failed completely. No, I think yes. <laughs> I think I uh, I think I failed. <laughs> <laughs> I I I mean I've I've had some there's some very interesting cases that I haven't put up there where uh, where I've for example there's there's been a couple of cases where I know the patient's got cancer. But there's nothing in the biopsy. Yeah. And the yeah. AI is finding something. And really? Yeah. Despite doing immunohistochemistry, chemistry, for example, in, the, in those squeeze marks of the forceps. Yeah. For example. So there's something in it. There's some stromal reaction that it's picking up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. some of the companies are a bit worried by that. But I think it's particularly interesting. Uh, so that is interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. 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 Picking up things which we're not seeing. Um, we've we've question got a question from the middle here. 
Uh, hi. Uh, being a GI pathologist myself, I'd love to see all those implemented where I work as well at some time. Uh, but my question to you is a more pathology based one. That case you example you showed us of uh, parietal cell vacuolation. The uh, parietal cell vacuolation, I think you showed oh, us. Yeah, cell vacuolation. Yeah. yeah. How do you diagnose that? Especially, I'm presuming the cytokeratin would have been positive anyway. Yeah. What are the diagnostic clues for that one? Uh, you can see, actually, what I did show you there was a very high power view of the most abnormal area. But if you look at it at low power, you know, you could see they're forming normal glands. I mean, you could you could worry, for example, about in situ signet ring cells, which are almost never seen. But you could see that they were they were blending into normal parietal cells. I mean, you can also do uh, proton pump inhibitor, sorry, proton pump immunohistochemistry. Some specialized yeah. labs will do that. And I know Runjan Chetty's talked about that, but it's once you see it, it's fairly easy, to be honest. There's no eco in loss either. I did that. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I uh, have another question on the on the left there. Thanks. Take a while. Where's Novelli? I can't see him. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's coming over here. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a GI pathologist as well. I really enjoyed looking at all of those cases. Um, and I, I, my question is a practical one because I understand that it's very complicated the AI, but in terms of practical implication, because that's like what your talk was about at the beginning, you said, are we worried that AI is going to um, uh, that we're not needed anymore. And coming back to that, I, I imagine if you would use these this software that you would kind of, you might become dependent on it, that you would start to look in a different way. So if you're used to screening a H and E, and if you're already getting a heat map, you're going to work in a different way. And is that kind of disempowering us as pathologists, or maybe that's something you totally don't worry about, or I would be interested in your opinion on that. Yeah, that's a very good question and one which I didn't, I forgot to answer, to be honest, because I was distracted by all that noise. <laughs> um, no, I think you're right. I mean, do am, am I concerned about being replaced in my 50s at the moment? No, um, but perhaps younger pathologists might be more concerned about it. Um, I sort of felt if, if you if you look at those cases that I presented, in fact, what the AI was doing was just giving you the straightforward first step. And in fact, all of them pretty much needed to be thought about and worked up properly um, before the, the the full diagnosis was revealed. Um, however, I, th I do think that most of those additional steps will probably be worked out by AIs at some point. Um, I think at the moment we're in this quite interesting and desirable part of the development of AI where, in fact, it could actually teach us a bit as well. Um, but I think at the moment it's an adjunct. I think of it a bit like immunistic chemistry. You know, it's doing a lot of the things that immunohistochemistry is doing. You know, the neuroendocrine tumour, for example, an experienced GI pathologist will look at that and know what it is straight away. Yeah. But if you're not used to seeing those regularly, and of course we do immunohistochemistry, even though we know what it's going to be, we have to do the confirmatory yeah. stuff. So I think of it as being another adjunct to our work. Whether Will it replace us in the very long term? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> long after we go, I think. Um, any more questions? There's one one from the front here. Okay. Thank you for a great talk. Do you use the AI algorithm on all your biopsies? No. Okay, no, so how do you choose which biopsies you uh, would like the AI to uh, look for so something this, for you, yeah. especially in the helicobacter pylori decision making? Uh, how do you use it there? Does it do any good effort for you? At the moment, I'm not using it prospectively live, but um, you know, these were cases which were selected from my previous experience, um, which I'd scanned for my validation and things like that. Um, so, but how will we use it in the future? I think that's something we'll have to decide as a group. Um, but I've chosen those cases particularly because I thought they might cause the AI difficulty. Okay, so the next question is, so you don't know uh, how many false positive versus false negatives it would create and uh, how much effort you should use on that? There's been there's been quite a lot of data produced by that already and the UCH studies do have that and IBEX can certainly provide that and I've been through that but I don't know the exact figures off offhand but I know the sensitivity is extremely good. 
but yeah, as, at, at the moment, I think these AIs are set for sensitivity more than specificity, mm. so that you can be directed to towards an abnormality. It's not saying, you, you know, uh, we we we're concerned as pathologists, aren't we, about false positives? Mm. But I think at the moment, let's just, we've talked about other algorithms, and I think the most important thing is going to be make, knowing that that AI is not going to miss any cancer. Can I ask one last question? Yeah. So this is, when you have uh, done it on these cases that you have chosen, uh, how did you set the sensitivity of the heat map? Because you could like choose a sensitivity of the heat map. So have you tried and uh, then you found that especially? No. No, the, well, I'm not, I'm not aware that it's possible to alter that. I mean, the AI company may be able to do that with more training, but I'd okay. be using it straight out of the box, presumably. Yeah, I was using yeah. it straight yeah. out of the box. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. They have they have they have um, modified it slightly, mm. and I have looked at one or two cases which are perhaps a little bit oversensitive that have been uh, uh, tweaked a bit. So there is it has changed. Well, you can but, discuss that with the IBEX team, no doubt, who are, who are at the conference. But. Uh, well, thank you very much, Tim. I think you've got some great cases for the FRC path exam there. I look forward to seeing those come up again. Thank you.